Hello guys, welcome to my channel. Today I am going to dictate a transcription in this video of 80 words per minute. Get ready. 10 seconds. 5 seconds. Start. The court may, of course, presume as mentioned in S114 of the Indian Evidence Act, the existence of any fact which it thinks likely to have happened regard being had to be common course of natural events. Human conductor and public and private business in their relation to the facts of the particular case. The illustrations mentioned in that section through taken from different spheres of human activity are not exhaustive. They are based upon human experience and have to be applied in the context of the facts of each case. The illustrations are merely examples of circumstances for which certain presumptions may be made. Other presumptions of in which certain presumptions similar circumstances can be made under the provisions of the section itself. Whether or not a presumption can be drawn under the section in a particular case depends ultimately upon the facts and circumstances of each case. No hard and first rule can be laid down. Another golden thread which runs through the web of the administration of justice in criminal case is that if two views are possible on the evidence adduced in the case, one pointing to the guilt of the accused and the other to his innocence. The view which is favorable to the accused should be adopted. This principle has a special relevance in cases wherein the guilt of the accused is sought to be established by circumstantial evidence. Rule has accordingly been laid down that unless the evidence adduced in the case is consistent only with the hypothesis of the guilt of the accused and is inconsistent with that of his innocence. The court should refrain from recording a finding of guilt of the accused. It is also an accepted rule that in case the court entrains reasonable doubt regarding the guilt of the accused. The court entertains reasonable doubt regarding the guilt of the accused. The accused must have the benefit of that doubt. Of course, the doubt regarding the guilt of the accused should be reasonable. It is not the doubt of a mind which is either so vacillating that it is incapable of reaching a firm conclusion or so timid that it is 
hesitant and afraid to take things to their natural consequences the rule regarding the benefit of doubt also does not warrant acquitted of the accused by resort to surmises conjunctures or fanciful conditions there has to be clear evidence of the guilt of the fanciful and in the absence of that if it is not possible to record a finding of his guilt in arriving at the conclusion about the guilt of the accused charged with the commission for a crime the court has to be judged the evidence by the yardstick of probabilities is intrinsic worth and the animus of witnesses every case in the final analysis would have to depend upon its own facts although the benefit of every reasonable doubt should be given to the accused the courts should not at the same time reject evidence which is ex trustworthy on grounds which are fanciful or in the nature of conjectures the guilt of the accused has to be adjusted not by the fact a vast number of people believe him to guilty but whether his guilt has been established by the evidence brought on record indeed the courts have hardly any other yardstick or material to adjudicate the guilt of the person in a murder trial when an accused person stands charged with the commission of an offence punishable under section 302 he stands the risk of the being subjected to the highest penalty prescribed by such cases has to cause yes circumspect and careful in dealing with such appeals or reference proceedings where the question of confirming a death sentence is involved the high court has also to deal with the matter carefully and to examine all relevant and material circumstances before upholding the convictions and confirming the sentence of death all before the high court on other behalf must be scrupulously examined and considered before a final decision is reached that 10 persons had serious and onerous responsibility on the high court dealing with the present appeals in dealing with oral evidence a court of appeal would normally be reluctant to differ from the appreciation of oral evidence by the trial court because obviously the trial court has the advantage of watching the demonstration because obviously of the witnesses but that is not to say that even in a proper case the appeal court cannot interfere with such appreciation besides the criticism made by the trial court is not so much in relation to the democracy of the witnesses as in regard to their patriotism character and the overstate 
governments which they made as patriotism witnesses are generally apt to do.